Welcome back to Outsiders on our second last program of the year. But don't worry, we'll be back bigger and better in 2020 and we'll even have a new evening show for you. I was supposed to say that, was I? But anyway, everybody knows. I'm Rita Panahi and as always, I'm here with the monophoric James Morrow and the rattle-pated Rowan Dean. These are real words. <laughs> Soon we'll be diving into a special edition of Wackademia with a guest who has been investigating just how your tax dollars are being used. But first, I wanted to talk about Israel Folau's triumph this week. The former Wallaby star sacked for sharing his religious beliefs on his own Instagram page received an apology and a substantial multi-million dollar financial settlement from Rugby Australia. No wonder Israel and Maria were smiling as they emerged from the final mediation session. No one at Rugby Australia would be smiling, least of all their disaster-prone chief executive, Raylene Castle, who should, along with the board, step down immediately. Whether you are devout in your religious beliefs, a godless heathen like me, or like most Australians, somewhere in between, you should be happy with what happened in the Federal Circuit Court in Melbourne on Wednesday. The usual hyperventilating media hysterics led by pirate Peter Fitzsimons are predictably beside themselves. But rest assured, the Falau settlement was a significant victory for free speech and religious freedom in Australia. Let's not forget that during this sorry episode, Israel's wife Maria, who is an elite professional netballer, was also bullied by corporates and commentators alike for the crime of standing by her husband. It's curious that the leftists who preach most loudly about tolerance are the least likely to show it. Those who seized on Falau's recent comments linking natural disasters to God's wrath as justification for Rugby Australia's decision missed the point entirely. People stood with Falau not because they agreed with him, but because they believe in free speech. They believe in religious freedom and they are appalled by the overreach that sees employers punish employees for wrong speak. The modern left lost its way in this country the moment it abandoned the notion that though I disagree with what you say, I will defend your right to say it. The left has ceded the principle of free speech to its ideological opponents on the centre right. It was conservatives, most of whom vehemently disagreed with Folau's beliefs, that made his vindication possible. Quiet Australians donated more than 700,000 to, to help fund Folau's legal battle. But before he could use the funds, the GoFundMe page was deleted thanks to a campaign by leftist activists. But that only increased Folau's support and after the Australian Christian Lobby hosted a new fundraising page, more than 2.2 million was donated in about two days before the site was closed to further donations. That thousands of regular folk would put their hands in their pocket to help a millionaire footballer fight for his rights tells you how deeply many Australians feel about the issue of free speech. It's why there is resounding support for tennis great Margaret Court to be recognised in the same manner that Rod Laver was on the 50th anniversary of her Grand Slam year. Tennis Australia's cowardice in kowtowing to the tolerance police has been absolutely pitiful. They finally invited Margaret Court to Melbourne Park for the coming Australian Open, but then in the same statement, launched into a lengthy diatribe about diversity, inclusion, and slammed the tennis legend's personal views, which they claim to have demeaned and hurt many in our community over a number of years. How about recognising a sporting legend for her sporting achievements, instead of judging her for holding traditional religious beliefs? Margaret Court should receive the same adulation and respect Tennis Australia showed Rod Laver because they are sporting equals. No one is interested in a lecture from a woke sporting body. But back to Rugby Australia, who in their religious-like fervour to be inclusive, succeeded in alienating a sizeable portion of their supporter base and significantly their playing group around a third of whom have Polynesian backgrounds and, like Falau, are devout Christians. The news that a number of current and former Wallabies were willing to testify against Rugby Australia probably contributed to Falau securing that multi-million dollar settlement. The architect of this catastrophe, Raylene Castle, must step down. 
but she's still claiming that she got it right. We made the right decision in, in calling out um, Israel um, on his, on his uh, posts and on his inappropriate uh, messaging. Uh, that remains the same. Yes, people who've done nothing wrong often issue grovelling apologies and sign a multi-million dollar cheque. And you can ignore the pathetic spin coming from the Code and its media fanboys in today's papers, <laughs> who are trying to paint this massive payout as a good result. Rugby Australia is floundering on and off the field. Fresh from the worst World Cup performance in Australian history, it has yet to secure a decent broadcasting deal and now must pay out a settlement it can ill afford. Rugby's wounds are self-inflicted and they will continue to hemorrhage money and support until they remove Castle and, in fact, every single member of the board that was party to this insanity. The entire episode hasn't just been disastrous for the code, but it's also been humiliating for the many media commentators who backed the decision to sack Folau and declared that he didn't have a legal leg to stand on. Wasn't it fun reading all those uh, self-delighted, self-appointed legal experts in the media who concluded that Folau's legal action was destined for failure due to his workplace contract? Let's hope this serves as a warning to employers everywhere who want to impose their politics or belief systems on employees. Uh, this was just remarkable. And to see all these media folk who are, on the one hand, preaching about press freedom... I, I can't oh. think who you mean. Mm. There was a red bandana. Okay. Over the he wasn't alone. He led the pack, but he wasn't alone. <laughs> no, not um, at all. But they think press freedom is, is paramount, but people who aren't in the press should be sacked for, oh, exactly. for but what, stating what was, their what beliefs. Was, what was fascinating is that Australians really can... Uh, you quoted Voltaire there, the idea that I do not necessarily agree with you, but I defend to the death your right to, to, to say it, particularly with the second Israel Folau comment. That was yeah. the one, the bushfires one, which people went, really, really, OK, completely disagree with it, but I'm still going to stick by his right to say it because that's his religious belief. And that that's, was a defining moment, I think. People found it repulsive, but they said he still has a right to say it. I think you're absolutely right, Roland. But I think also, on one level, I'm a little bit disappointed here, guys, because I kind of wanted to see this go to the court. Oh, yes. I wanted to see <laughs> Raylene Castle and Rugby Australia absolutely smashed up, and I wanted a court to come down with a judgment that said, no, employers, you do not have a right with some very vaguely worded code of conduct. Janet Albertson was really strong on that this weekend in The Australian. A, a code of conduct that's really vaguely worded so that basically all of your speech that you, that you commit outside your workplace, outside your 9 to 5 job, is regulated because the idea that in our civil society, you're, that we, you, if you're an employee, you can't say what you think about politics unless it goes along with the company's values, whatever they are, that's a very limited uh, space we don't want to live in. And, and you can't have workplace agreements do away with legislated rights, which is Correct. what they were doing. That's, you you yeah, can't just uh, get people to sign something and say, your rights are banished. Good news, though, uh, Israel Folau apparently throughout this entire ordeal has been training three hours a day. He's in <laughs> peak fitness. If people want to... Uh, NRL clubs or yeah, yeah. other oh, teams want to... Uh, career in front of him. Why wouldn't you? 